This was the first great experiment in wresting the money power from the goldsmiths. This cheap form of money circulated for the benefit of all citizens equally, not just the usual gold coins, which always benefit the rich. With this new, plentiful supply of money, real wealth flowed to the common man. Without the use of either gold or silver, Rome became mistress of commerce of the world. Her people were the bravest, the most prosperous, the most happy, for they knew no grinding poverty. Her money was issued directly to the people and was composed of a cheap material, copper and brass, based alone upon the faith and credit of the nation. With this abundant money supply, she built her magnificent courts and temples. She distributed her lands among the people and small holdings, and wealth poured into the coffers of Rome. But then, suddenly Julius Caesar changed the Roman money supply drastically. He started minting gold coins with his image on them. Then he declared himself emperor for life, putting an end to Rome's great experiment in elected government. The Republicans in the Senate hated gold money and the plutocracy, ruled by the rich, that it implied. Although the senators assassinated Julius Caesar, gold money now had taken root, empowered by the very rich and the dictators they were able to buy with their gold. After Caesar's assassination, copper and brass were demonetized, taken out of circulation. The quantity of money was reduced by 90%. A deep depression set in. The average person had to sell his property just to buy basic necessities. The wealth of the nation was quickly concentrated into the hands of the richest Romans once again. Gone was the incentive to work hard and build a great nation for the common good. By 401 AD, Rome was sacked by the Visigoths and humanity was plunged into the gloom of the Dark Ages. So, in Rome, we learned that with cheap government-issued money, the Roman Republic flourished, but under gold money, it perished. This controversy between cheap money and gold money continues throughout history and, as we'll see, is symbolized in part by the yellow brick road. Flash forward seven centuries to 1100 AD in England. There were no banks like we think of them today. What served as banks were the goldsmiths, those who made their gold into gold coins. Although most people didn't understand it, these goldsmiths controlled the economy of the nation and thereby even the politics, even in a monarchy. By acting in concert, goldsmiths could either make money scarce or plentiful. When they made their gold money plentiful, the economy of the nation flourished. When they made their gold coins scarce, a depression set in and they could buy up assets for pennies on the dollar. About 1100 AD, King Henry I, the son of England's first Norman king, William the Conqueror, was low on gold money. A series of costly wars had depleted the royal treasury. So just as colonial Pennsylvania would do hundreds of years later, Henry created a unique form of government-issued money called tally sticks. Tally sticks did not represent any quantity of gold or any other commodity. They were simply polished sticks of wood issued by the king, which he declared to be good for the payment of taxes. That made tally sticks just as good as any other form of money. All right, here we are in the Bank of England Museum. Uh, with curator John Keyworth, and I'm holding in my hand uh, one of the oldest forms of British money. This is called a tally stick. This is actually a very rare uh, example of a tally stick because it has the two halves of the tally stick. The idea with the tally stick was that you cut notches in a piece of wood. Usually it was hazel, and these notches were of a prescribed size dimension. Yeah, and if you look at this one, yeah. you can see it's got 1,000 pound notches. So, so there's six notches times 1,000 pounds each. Is that the way that's it is? That's exactly So it. that's a 6,000 6, pound pounds. tally stick. Uh, this side is called the? The stock. This was kept by the, by the person who made the loan 
or I see. paid the money in. I see. And this is the, the foil. And which so the foil given... would be spent into existence, and the idea was uh, this uh, splitting the stick down the middle was to prevent counterfeiting because, of course, a stick splits uniquely down the middle. Because when the debt was repaid, the two pieces were put together, and if they didn't tally, something was awry. The longer half of a tally stick was called the stock, the root word for stocks and bonds or stockholders. For centuries, the supporters of gold-backed money have belittled tally sticks as an unimportant form of fiat money, one not backed by gold or silver. Some authors even claim that tallies weren't a real money system because they were only used for very large transactions, but that's just not the case. And uh, was this the, the common size of tally sticks? In the Middle Ages, uh, the average size was the was reckoned to be the length from a man's, the tip of his thumb to the tip of his forefinger, quite short. Because if you think of it in terms of this, this is uh, 6,000 pounds, that means it's a huge, huge sum yeah. of money. So the, the wider the spacing, the larger the, the larger the amount, but it was a prescribed distance. It was an inch and half, I think half an inch for hundreds and a quarter of an inch for, for tens. And then it became little lines drawn across with a saw. So it is clear that tally sticks were used for smaller denominations too and worked well as an effective debt-free money system for 726 years. Without the crushing weight of debt-based money, England flourished into the greatest power on earth for many centuries. At their peak, it has been estimated that 95% of English money was in the form of tally sticks. Compare that to today, where the only debt-free government-issued money is in the form of coin, about 3% of the money supply in the UK and far less in the US. After democratizing the money power of the nation with tally sticks, King Henry then began decentralizing political power as well. King Henry granted something called the Charter of Liberties, voluntarily stating what his powers were under law. Before that, kings had assumed unlimited power. This was followed in 1215 by the Magna Carta, the basis of the U.S. Constitution. A new class began to develop, the merchant class. Trade routes grew, and new towns sprang up along them. This mercantile class needed stability, and so they supported the king, his strong central government, and the rule of law. In 1265, the first parliamentary elections were held. Government by the people in England was born. As money poured into the middle class, the small business persons of the day, feudalism began to break down, and the English Renaissance was born. By the 1600s, serfdom in England was legally banned. Humanity, at least in England, was finally set free. Literature flourished. Now there was money to support artistic endeavors like the plays of William Shakespeare. The nation was at ease due to a debt-free money. Although life in the Middle Ages was certainly not easy by today's standards, once tally sticks were killed and the nation became indebted to bankers, it got worse. After 600 years, the money changers were finally able to begin to reassert their control over English money when they convinced the Parliament to create the Bank of England. This put the banking community back in control of manipulating the quantity of English money. Now England had to borrow its money supply from banks and pay interest on it instead of the government simply issuing its own money without such debt. So in England, we learned that simple sticks of wood broke the monopoly of gold money. This debt-free money lasted for seven centuries and allowed a small island nation to rule the waves and freedom to root deeply in the new middle class. With the goldsmiths back in control, England was now financing its wars with this bank loan money. Just 75 years later, England's war debts consumed 75% of its budget. Three quarters of British taxes were spent just on paying the interest on its war bonds. As a result, England needed to squeeze more and more money from all her colonies to pay the interest on this new growing debt. America was no exception. Pre-revolutionary America was still relatively poor. 
there was a severe shortage of precious metal coins to trade for goods. So the early colonists were increasingly forced to experiment with printing their own homegrown paper money. This paper money was called colonial scrip. Colonial scrip was a dangerous concept for bankers. It broke the colonies free of the privately owned central bank system where money had to be created by banks and then loaned to governments, as Franklin put it. In the colonies, we issue our own money. It is called colonial scrip. We control its purchasing power, and we have no interest to pay to no one. In 1764, the British Parliament passed the Currency Act. Again, it ordered all Americans to pay their taxes in gold or silver coin. For those who believe that a return to a gold-backed money is the answer for America's current monetary problems, look what happened to America after the Currency Act of 1764 was passed. As Franklin put it, In one year, the conditions were so reversed that the era of prosperity ended and a depression set in, to such an extent that the streets of the colonies were filled with unemployed. To Ben Franklin, this return to a gold money system was the basic cause for the American Revolution. The colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. Americans were mad and did everything they could to get around Britain's gold money system. In 1765, Parliament passed the Stamp Act, requiring that every item sold had to have a stamp placed on it indicating that a tax had been paid on that item and paid in gold. This is what drove America to open revolt. Do you understand what that means? Without gold, you could literally buy or sell nothing. Why? because the British had successfully forced the colonies to pay for everything using only a precious commodity, gold. This is the very definition of the word plutocracy, rule by the rich. These people that deal with gold and silver only have never spent one minute of actually trying to figure out how it worked in history, how it would work in real life, and the only way they can support their gold theories is they just treat it as religion and said, we don't have to understand it, we just know that that's God's money and it'll work, and that's not true. By the outbreak of the revolution in April 1775, the colonies started printing a new form of paper money to finance the war. It was called continental currency because unlike colonial scrip, it was the first issued by the new central government. Continentals worked great at first, but then the British started counterfeiting it massively, sending it to America literally by the bail. By the end of the war, the currency was virtually worthless. As George Washington lamented, a wagon load of money will scarcely purchase a wagon load of provisions. Earlier, colonial scrip had worked because just enough was issued to facilitate trade and counterfeiting was minimal. In other words, the quantity was controlled by the government that issued it. Gold bugs today try to claim that because paper money didn't work during the Revolutionary War, it shouldn't be used today. But keep in mind, it doesn't matter what backs your money. All that matters is who controls its quantity. Will it be your elected officials, or will it be some unelectable banker? Colonial paper money before the Revolution had worked so well that the Bank of England had Parliament outlawed and forced America to use only gold money, gold which they controlled. In our next stop on the Yellow Brick Road, which represents the banker's gold money system, we find how the curse of the privately owned central bank first came to America. In 1781, towards the end of the war, the Continental Congress met here in Philadelphia. They pondered what to do about their grave financial situation. The money was so worthless that people papered their walls with it. Congress finally agreed to give a group of bankers a monopoly on creating U.S. money by loaning it to the government. It was the first privately owned central bank. The plan, of course, was modeled on the Bank of England. The new bank would be called the Bank of North America. It would be the first of a string of controversial, privately owned central banks, which Congress would charter, then in the face of public outrage, uncharter over the years. 
Four years later, in 1785, the value of the new currency had plummeted. Inflation was rampant. Prices had risen by 72%. So, after a stiff battle, Congress killed this, the first privately owned central bank in America. Two years later, when it came time to write the Constitution in 1787, many of the delegates didn't